Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to our next uh, CME CDE course that we have uh, scheduled for this evening. Um, before I introduce our guests who have been with us many times already, I want to go over some housekeeping items. Um, please, uh, <clears throat> at the end of conclusion of this, you will get two CME and two CDE uh, credits. Uh, I believe Hospic will have questions. Um, a few dates just to keep in mind and block your schedule. Um, on March 5th, uh, we will have our infection control uh, talk again via Zoom again. March 12th, we'll have the California Dental Act, which are all requirements, as most of you know, if you're a dental provider every two years. In sometime in April, we're going to have an alt, a topic on opioid. It's going to be uh, the topic is going to be alternatives to opioids, uh, but it's going to be sometime in April. We'll let you know. In May, May fourth, we're going to have our annual uh, gala, and we're going to be honoring uh, two wonderful people that have been doing uh, work for a couple organizations, which most of you know about. One is Jane Mahakian. One is Salpia Karagian. Uh, our annual Vegas retreat will be September 6th through the 8th. It'll take place at the Wynn, so hopefully you guys can make it. It was a great turnout last year. And sometime in the fall, we haven't picked the date yet, we'll have our wellness retreat, which we had in Palm Springs uh, this past year, which was, uh, which was fantastic. Actually, it was a great turnout and a lot of good topics. Anyway, um, so... This evening's uh, topic is going to be vesicular, ulcerative, and bullous disease, which some of us see uh, sometimes in, you know, in the clinic. Uh, our speaker this evening is Dr. Virtoso Mondrial. She received her dental degree from the University uh, de Chile, uh, an advanced program certificate in prosthodontics. Um, then she earned her master's of science degree uh, in orofacial pain and oral medicine with an advanced program certificate in orofacial pain from USC. She wasn't done yet. She continued. I went off to USC at uh, UCSF and did another. I uh, did an oral medicine uh, res residency. Presently, she's on uh, full time staff at USC, and again this evening she's going to be talking about vesicular ulcerative and bullous uh, disease. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over the mic, Doctor Mitoso Montreal. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> Okay, so let me share my screen. So, okay, Dr. Dabudi, are we okay? Uh, yes, everything is good. Okay. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, many of us are coming back from work, so. Thank you for being here with us today. So the topic today is a little complex. Uh, when I was doing the, the lecture, uh, I, I was like challenged for all the different diseases that you can find, different manifestations. So I tried to put the one that we see in the clinic like more frequent. So we're gonna like try to review the most that we can in this uh, hour, an hour and a half that um, kindly the uh, Armenian Association of Medical, it, it's, uh, it's giving us for us today. So the topic is oral manifestation of vesicular uh, ulcerative or bullous diseases. As um, Dr. Cotinian gave me the introduction, um, uh, an assistant professor of clinical dentistry and director of the distant learning and, and telehealth department of the, in the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry. I have no uh, commercial or financial disclosure to do. And just uh, briefly, so you know uh, who are you listening to today? Um, uh, I did my advanced uh, certificate in prosthodontics in the Universita, uh, Universidad del Desarrollo, my master's degree in Herman Nostro School of Dentistry at USC. I did also my residency there in orofacial pain. And then I did an additional uh, year and a half uh, training in oral medicine at UCSF. I'm a board certified in, um, in orofacial pain and also I'm a me member of the board of director of the orofacial pain. I am society and American, I'm a member of the American Academy of Official Pain. I am a member of the uh, Oral Medicine Academy and I, I'm co-director of the pain medicine program at the Keck uh, School of Medicine. 
so many stuff. So I I have the 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 um, the advantage to see many many patients with several conditions. Most of them are systemic uh, uh, condi uh, patients that has systemic conditions. So that's that's what I'm trying to bring today. Like all the variety of patients that we can see in all the different conditions that this patient can present and how we see it in the um, in the oral mucosa. So how we are gonna review that? I I, I put it like when when we first start the, this uh, option to do the lecture, I said like very uh, strict and and a structured uh, topic, but I tried to put everything together in the slide in the way that it will be uh, easy for you to understand the different topics. So the first part we are gonna go for introduction in to autoimmune and immune mediated diseases to understand the the different kind and what is the difference between these two and how they, uh, also the similarities. Some of the clinical presentation, of course, I'm gonna focus on the oral cavity. And uh, some of the histopathological features that are important to distinguish between each other and the differential diagnosis. That's why we, uh, it's important to know to actually do the, the proper therapeutic approach and treatment. So when we talk about, um, one second. when we talk about autoimmune diseases, Everything that you look in in the in the literature or in internet, you will find uh, this this chart is like the first chart that you actually figure that you will find when you just put in Google autoimmune diseases. So as you see, there is nothing about oral manifestation. So they say the autoimmune diseases are mainly a result from the dysregulation of immune process and pathway uh, that make that your immune uh, system respond abnormally. This results in pathological damage of, the, uh, of uh, different tissues. But in this chart, you see that there is nothing, no, no mention about oral manifestation. So that's why we are covering today. The combination of environmental and genetic component are a risk factor. But as you see, they say, okay, the symptoms could be myocarditis, skin uh, rash, impervisions, pulmonary fibrosis, joint pain, um, there are uh, and several organs that can be affected, the spleen, the bone marrow, the lymph node, um, the lifestyle of it's a, a huge uh, component, hormone influence also, in, environmental factor. But again, there's nothing mentioned about the oral manifestation and oral issues. So to understand what what are the probably oral lesions that we can see, how how we call what it, what we call lesions of this uh, or oral manifestation of these conditions. Well, we need to understand the difference between different uh, presentations. Like first, the vesicle. How, what is what we call a vesicle? What we call a bulla? When, when we we say that is an ulcer? How we distinguish between these two or the three different terms? And what is the erosion? So a vesicle, like you see in this in this uh, sketch uh, diagram, is like a, flu, a fluid field elevation. In some book or in some author, we say that less than five uh, millimeters, other than less than one centimeter. But it's like when we call like a, a vesicle a, a fluid field elevate elevated lesion, a small. Then we have the the bulla is a little bigger, more than five millimeters or one centimeter. And then we have the ulcer that is actually happening when this. Uh, the bulla or oh, uh, breaks, or and and it could be presented as well as a well circumscribed, sometimes depressed lesion with some epithelial defect, and you will see the the yellow which around that is the fibrin clot, and given the um, this color appearance, and the erosion at the end is like this red lesion is often caused by the rupture of this vesicle or bulla or trauma, so. It's important to know the difference because some of these manifestations will start as a vesicle, other uh, will, uh, you will see only the ulcer, you will not see in the clinic the vesicle because it's, it's very uh, fragile. So you will see either the ulcer or the erosion, but that doesn't mean that it, it wasn't a bullet before. So it's more like the patient tells you that they feel like a balloon in, in the mouth. So what are the possible um, clinical uh, manifestation or presentation that you will see? So in this in this slide, I tried to put like several of, of our patients. So one in the in the top and like in the ventral tongue, in the you will see like a it was a bulla before, and then in the clinic we just see the ulcer. In the lower part, in the in the lingual side of the teeth, on the lower teeth, you will see like kind of like a bulla. 
Uh, that's rare, very rare. So if you chew like a bulla in a vesicle, um, depending of course of the author, but the important thing is like a a fluid field uh, lesion that then when it's, it's, it's sprayed, uh, you will see the ulcer or the erosion, as you see, like in the lower side of the of the image, um, on the on the buccal uh, gingiva, you will see that it's kind of like the erosion or the ulcer that you will see after the the bulla is break. And then you see the other the other picture. I can see some erythematous area. So how we distinguish this erosion? This is important uh, depending on the clinical manifestation and also the history of the patient. So this is kind of what, what we're gonna review today. So when we talk about uh, general presentation of the autoimmune disease, you will find okay, symptoms very significant between individual. Not all, uh, all patients uh, will present the same uh, symptoms. They have periods where it's very extreme that their reactivity and they have like these flare up symptoms. And also they will have some stages when there is no symptoms. There are free pain, free burning, and everything is stable. But it comes and goes. The initial symptoms, how we start uh, suspecting that a patient has can be can have an autoimmune condition, is when patient present with some fatigue, rashes in the skin. In general, we are talking about the skin. Remember all the definition that we you find most the definition that you find or description in the literature is mainly, uh, or in the website. <clears throat> in the internet is, is mainly um, general, no, like in the mucosa. General localized pain and also low grade fever. And also they, they are very associated with inflammation. It's a classic indicator of autoimmune condition. So when we, when we start reviewing, okay, what are the major autoimmune disorders? You will find all these lists. So you will find uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, myasthenia gravis, that's something that we also as dentists or, or in a physician you will see. Uh, but it's more, uh, this has affected like the neuromuscular junction, the grave disease uh, affecting the, the thyroid gland, Hashimoto disease, th uh, type 1 diabetes, mainly for insulin dependent uh, patients, uh, rheumatic fever. But then we have, when we go down in the list, we start uh, seeing something that we see in our clinic, like uh, as dentists or, or um, physicians that you treat uh, more oral lesions. And this is the pemphigus vulgaris. This is an audio, uh, audio antibody to a uh, epidermal component. And, and you will see again, it's more like uh, the, um, the description. You will find that it's more the description in the skin lesions. But then when you go deeper in the pemphigus vulgaris, you see that uh, many of these patients present oral manifestation. Then you have the other that I want to mark here is like the systemic lupus erythematos that also you see in, in the description in this chart of the symptoms is like skin rash, arthritis, vasculitis, glomerulitis, but nothing mentioned about the oral lesion when you will see that we have patient with oral manifestation. And then we have children syndrome and other, other autoimmune condition that we have oral manifestations with dry mouth and um, and the dry mouth can uh, lead to the development of ulceration at the end. So how to test this, uh, how, how we test autoimmunity? But based on the presentation of the symptoms, we need to start seeing the patient uh, presentation. Uh, will have one or a series of clinical features. Usually it's not just one, can have a less series of them. Often the evaluation of the disorder is accompanied with, uh, by a positive laboratory test with um, persistence of these immune markers over multiple periods. So you need to take uh, one lab test in uh, every three months, six months to actually diagnose the patient with autoimmune condition. And these tests sometimes overlap with a common auto uh, reactive antigen, so auto, uh, antibody against nuclear component and they can be fine in several diseases, as we, uh, we will see during the lecture. So the combination of the test with the histology and pathology allows a better or a more accurate um, diagnosis and assignment of the specific disease states. Because if we just go for one uh, lab test, it will not be a specific. So we don't have a specific lab test for, our, for one autoimmune condition. So what are the possible tests? So we have an uh, anti-nuclear antibody. We have anti-DNA uh, and antibody for uh, lupus. For Sjogren, usually we use ANA. 
for in a, in a, another test. And for rheumatoid arthritis, we see there a rheumatoid factor. So several tests. For uh, if we see the, the, this this chart, uh, I did it for more for uh, which condition we should uh, um, recommend or have at least the value of the ANA. So when we suspect a uh, systemic lupus erythematose or a uh, Sjogren's syndrome, when we suspect polymyositis, when we suspect <clears throat> mixed connective tissue disease, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile uh, idiopathic arthritis, so and so. But when we suspect uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematose, we will have a, a positive ANA. If we have a, um, a negative ANA, then we have to repeat, and we have to do a round, another round of a more specific um, serologic test. So you see that it's not simple to diagnose this condition, but it's, it's for us, it's very simple to see the lesions. So let's see we, with the lesion, we can identify at least if we are in the area of the scope of this condition that then we should uh, start uh, studying more in depth this patient with a uh, serologic test. So the autoimmune diseases with oral manifestation, the most common or more present that we'll see in the clinic, in most in the oral medicine clinic, it will be a mucous membrane pemphigoid or a pemphigus vulgaris. So we are gonna see several of them. Other condition that we see in the, in the clinic uh, with oral manifestation is the systemic lupus erythematose. So usually the signs and symptoms of this condition will be the butterfly, uh, butterfly rash. Uh, have a multi-organ involvement. So we have a skin, musculoskeletal system, patient will have arthralgia, joint pain, arthritis. Uh, it could affect the hematologic system. It could affect the central nervous system as well. It could affect the kidney. But also, 45% of this patient will have oral lesions. And this is a patient of ours that we saw in the clinic. And this patient presents like these lesions, erosions, you see erosion kind uh, like uh, ulcers, uh, symmetrically in both sides. On This is the area, this is the right and left palate. So this is the area between um, the vestibule of the right and left side. So it's very symmetrical representation. The treatment for uh, this condition in general, systemic lupus erythematose, is topical or systemic immunosuppressive agent, uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, because the patient take hydroxychloroquine, they need to uh, do a periodic eye exam due to the risk of uh, retinal toxicity. And the differential diagnosis for us in the, in, the, in the oral cavity, when we see a lesion like that, or a presentation like that, we have to uh, rule out a lichen planus. So then it's when we start doing uh, like a different tests, like biopsy, for example. Then we have pemphigus vulgaris. Pemphigus vulgaris and, and vegetan, both of them affect the oral cavity. And pemphigus vulgaris, uh, it's the most common of the pemphigus. Uh, it's binding of the IgG antibody to the desmoglein 3. So that caused the loss on the intercellular connection. And that we'll see how that look in the histopathologic view. And more than 50% of the patient will develop oral lesions before the onset of the cutaneous lesion. So even could be a year before. So you see, this is a patient with pemphigus vulgaris presenting with oral lesions. So we don't see, rarely we can see the bulla, but we can, uh, we can see how this, um, the ulcer happen. And when we ask the patient, they will tell you that before the ulcer, they present this other uh, uh, lesion. The drug, um, there is also a, an option to have a drug induced pemphigus, and these are the medication that can cause this condition as well. So it could be triggered by the immune system and also by a drug, different drug, like a, a NSAID or a rifampicin, levodopa, aspirin, calcium. So it's, it's good to have this, um, this name in the mind. So we understand that when sometimes patients uh, come with a lesion, we need to do the, uh, a good medical history to see if they change any of this medication that can trigger uh, this condition. The oral lesion of, uh, in pemphigus vulgaris are painful, very painful. 
usually that are presented as erythematose, very shallow and irregular thin wall bulla that rapidly breaks and leaves this irregular er erosion, as you see here. And it may start also as a desquamative gingivitis, so it's not that specific at the beginning. And like I said, it's very important to ask the, ask the patient how the lesion start, how they were feeling this lesion. It's positive for Nikolsky sign. This is a very, <laughs> everyone say this, but I, I have never done the uh, performed the Nikolsky sign because actually it's very painful for patients and you, don't, you shouldn't need to do it. But if you do it, you can have a bulla can be induced by a um, firm lateral pressure in the mucosa. And usually they do also that in the skin. Um, but in most of our patients, we don't need to do that. It, it causes pain uh, in the patient because the history and the, and, and the presentation will tell us that we need to do biopsy and rule out or rule, it, rule in this, uh, any of these autoimmune conditions. Benfigus vulgaris is occurring in mainly older patients. It's not a, a common condition for younger population, and um, it has some ethnicity associated, and the susceptibility also for uh, some genetic component that also is important to understand. And again, these are are, are, are like I like the 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 clinical presentation that you can see. So how we diagnose this? Well, we Nikolsky sign test, that's an option, but it's not like that accurate. It's always positive, but um, you shouldn't need to do that. You can do the biopsy. The biopsy, you can take a biopsy uh, with h &A for the vesicle of the intact area. And then you do the DIF as well with, um, when you took the lesion, the specimen should have some lesion normal uh, appearing mucosa. And how this is the way that it's gonna show in the DIF, like this, uh, the position, <clears throat> intercellular deposition of the uh, IgG, in and you will see like this kind of mesh or net-like pattern. Then we have another version of the of the pemphigus that is like the one that it, we are more scared to see, and this is the one that we need to uh, start working with in, in oncologies. And, and, and it take a little more uh, serious or or more detailed workup than we need to go over because it's, it's a little more dangerous. And this is the severe variant of the pemphigus vulgaris that is paraneoplastic pemphigoid. Present with severe blister and erosions of the mucosa in the membrane and also in the skin. So this also affect, can affect the skin and is associated with some underlying neoplasm. So it's a multi-organ disease. And here in this picture, I cite this uh, uh, Castleman disease in paraneoplastic pemphigoid because it's very associated with, with this disease. So that affects the, the lungs. The non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, can be present about 42% uh, of the patients. Uh, also can be associated with chronic lymphocytic leukemia uh, with uh, Castleman's disease as well, sarcoma, <clears throat> thymomas is also a frequent, uh, like 6% of this patient. It could have this pulmonary involvement. And they are, again, it's for an adult condition. It's more uh, seen after 45 years old. And the treatment is similar than the pemphigoid, the, any autoimmune condition, uh, immunosuppression. But the difference is we are suspecting here some malignancy and we need to rule out a neo neoplasm in any part of the body. So we need to send patients for most of the time for oncologist um, treatment. Then we have another version that is more associated with some GI issue. And this is the pemphigus vegetans. So it's the benign variant of pemphigus vulgaris. The oral lesions are ulcers. But this has is a little more dirty kind of appearance, has this purulent surface, and may present as a cobblestone appearance. And the oral lesion with associated inflammatory bowel syndrome uh, is what we call the pyostomatitis, uh, stomatitis vegetans. And it could uh, be present in Crohn, Crohn disease or uh, ul um, ulcerative colitis. The treatment is the same because it's an autoimmune condition. So we'll see in detail how uh, the different medications that we use for uh, these conditions. 
Um, but the management and the, sometimes the first sign again is in the mouth. So the treatment, the oral lesion, maybe mainly you we can treat it successfully with topical steroid combined with systemic therapy to bring the disease under control. Uh, we also use other immuno immunosuppression uh, for patients that are not controlled with topical medication, like mycophenolate, mofetil, uh, some um, <clears throat> prednisone, rituximab, biologic, etc. Et for more. Uh, long-term remission and for severe cases when they are not responding, even the oral lesions, sometimes they don't respond to topical and we need to send for systemic medication. Usually we, we work very close with dermatologists <clears throat> and rheumatologists and this kind of autoimmune conditions. So the differential diagnosis are very uh, important to understand because it clinically can look very similar to herpes infection uh, to candidiasis, lichen planus, mm, uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, erythema multiforme, and uh, recurrent after stomatitis. So it could be, and you will see that these lesions appear during all the, the presentation for all the this, uh, different different condition because this differential diagnosis, it's, it's very uh, similar in all, uh, the presentation is very similar in all these conditions. So how we distinguish each of them, we're going to see during the presentation. So mucous membrane pemphigoid, the, what you call MMP, it's more associated uh, with an auto uh, antibody directed against the proteins, but this is happening not intercellular, it's happening the problem in the base mem membrane zone. And the problem with uh, here, it's causing this subepithelial split, and then will cause the formation of this vesicle in the scary. This again happened in older patients, even older than the previous pemphigoid, <coughs> pemphigus, um, older than 55 years old. It's more frequent in females and it's more common in Caucasian patients. Typically present as a relapsing and remitting mucos, mucosal inflammation. So all these conditions comes and goes. The only one that not comes and goes is the paraneoplastic, that the lesion comes and then there is something else going on, multi-organ involvement. Typically present uh, uh, like with the squamatic gingivitis first and then start with this very inflammative, inflammatory condition. The oral mucosa is involved in 80% of the cases. So it's a very common condition in the oral cavity. Uh, I mean, oral manifestation, and it has this scarring. The skin lesion also can be present, and the subsequent corneal damage and progressive scarring may lead to blinding. So we always have to manage this patient and with a referral to ophthalmology for evaluation of any scarring uh, lesion in the corneal area, and it has to be checked at least once a year. And this is the like the oral manifestation. See, like gingival inflammation. Uh, it could also cause uh, some uh, pus coming out from the from the gingiva. But if patient go for a uh, perio maintenance and it's not getting better, uh, getting better. So then we need to start thinking in something else. There is something else that is happening that is not associated just with plaque because the inflammation, as you see, is not correlated clinically with the amount of plaque that you see in the teeth. So the diagnosis for mucous membrane pemphigo is, of course, it's biopsy. For definitive diagnosis, we also do DIF. And the treatment are systemic corticosteroid. Uh, for, uh, for oral lesion, we usually try to uh, use it for short time. And then uh, topical corticosteroid is something that patients need to start managing and because this is a chronic condition that will have a uh, wax and gain, uh, way episode, a patient need to understand how to control it. Methotrexate is another option for treatment, rituximab, and other uh, medications that um, are mainly immunosuppressive. Again, the di differential diagnosis are like in planus. It could be very similar as pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, erythema multiforme also is a, a, it's a it's not that similar, but it can have some inflammation when it started. And also some drug reaction can cause a similar reaction uh, presentation in the, in the gingiva. So as you see in this, in this chart, 
the um the different manif clinical manifestation of each of these conditions many of them we we review are um, the pemphigus vulgaris the most that has uh, associated uh, gingival inflammation then you have the paraneoplastic um pemphigus that also has like involvement in the skin the bullous uh, pemphigoid, the MMP, and how they they look clini uh, clinically, it's similar, like this ulcerative. Paraneoplastic has also this necrotic uh, uh, kind of lesion, uh, but the the DIF of histology is the, the thing that it actually distinguishing between the pemphigoid and the pemphigus. The pemphigus will have this uh, kind of net um, um, uh, presentation, because it's inter intercellular, uh, the accumulation of the IgG. And then in the pemphigoid, <clears throat> you will see that it's more the concentration of the IgG, uh, IgG is in the, in the um, basic uh, uh, membrane zone. So th th how, that is how we distinguish finally, because clinically it could look all very similar. What treatment options are available for these autoimmune diseases? Esteroid, calcium uh, neuron inhibitor, uh, mTOR, the DNA synthesis, uh, synthesis inhibitor, and also biologic. So very quick, how we distinguish the different corticosteroids available that we have for this patient. We have a hydrocortisone, uh, fluocinonine, and clobetazole are the most common um, Esteroid that we use for uh, this oral manifestation. Usually, we use it in the in the formulation of ointment or gel. Uh, it could have it, we could use it also as a solution, but it's rare, it's more rarely to to find. And when these conditions are so severe that sometimes we uh, patient patients is in a lot of pain, we need to go for uh, systemic medication, and we usually go for prednisone. Prednisolone is another option. We can also do a short uh, time of medro dose pack. And um, when the lesions are so widespread, we can use dexamethasone rinse, so patient can uh, uh, rinse and, sw and no swallow, like uh, spit out um, the solution. And that will help a lot to reduce the inflammation and to treat the lesions. So you will have very uh, like good benefit of this. Uh, with this treatment. But all the, uh, why we always try to be not that close with systemic asteroid? Well, because they have some adverse events, some side effects. One of the adverse events are the osteoporosis. Um, the glucocorticoid uh, uh, induced osteoporosis is the most important potential complication of the long-term use of this therapy. The osteoblast uh, formation is decreased and the apoptosis of the mature osteoblast is increased. So we'll have more prolonged life and survival of the osteoclast. So the osteoporosis is something that is going to happen. And this is going um, is something that we don't want to... We are having this patient with all patients with this condition. So we, if we are adding something that is causing a more bone issue, it's something that we want to try to avoid. So that's why we are looking for new option of therapy and we are jumping to biologic or uh, try to manage this patient with topical first before to jump right away to a systemic. Other effects that have the corticosteroid that affect on bone metabolism. Uh, so uh, we cannot prescribe it for younger patients because they can reduce the bone uh, growth in children. It has been associated also osteonecrosis uh, of the jaw um mostly associated in cases with uh, or seen in cases with uh, systemic lupus um uh, systemic lupus erythematos but rarely occur in patients with uh, in, in low doses less than 20 mg per day usually when we start systemic steroid in this patient we will start in a, in a high dose 60 mg and then we decrease uh, so the maintenance dose is, is high. If we say it's 20 milligrams, usually the dermatologist will have a maintaining dose for five milli, uh, with five milligrams, but we'll have this first round or um, more, uh, more strong medication or infusion of biologic before to jump to the maintaining dose of prednisone. 
The effect on the skin also has a severe side effect. The skin will be like thinner. It can cause ecchymosis. Uh, hirsutism is also another uh, known uh, side effect. And even this can happen in lower doses. It could have a uh, myopathy, cardiovascular diseases, uh, a cushion syndrome, can have some uh, ophthalmologic uh, a, a side effect. Also can in increase the infection disease risk. So a patient will have, that happen in the, even with topical medications, we'll, we'll see patients that are using this medication often, like we'd say three times a day, every day for two, three weeks. And then they have to, uh, uh, when lesion come back, they have to start again the dose. So in this patient, they are in higher risk of develop a uh, candidiasis. So the infection diseases are true effect and true side effect that happen even in with topical medication or topical application. And also we have some metabolic and nervous system like uh, affect like hyperglycemia and lethargy or fatigue patient will feel very tired. Other medication that we use for this uh, condition is the calcineurium uh, inhibitor. And this is the known, uh, the, the most common one is the cyclosporine. It usually uh, is indicated for prevention of transplant, uh, transplant rejection. It's also very used in GBHD. And it's selected for some autoimmune conditions. When you have tried all the other medications, you can start uh, trying other medications that are patients that they don't respond to the traditional or uh, the most common uh, path. So you need to go for another similar action, similar immune, Im immunosuppressive, but something that can be uh, um, more well tolerated by the patient. This can be given intravenously or orally. The side effect of the cyclosporine is high, uh, gingival hyperplasia. It will see like 10, 10 to 30% of the patient will have this condition. The side effect also will cause mouth sores, paresthesia, myalgia, a hyperglycemia, liver dysfunction. And again, because we are uh, using an immunosuppressive, the increase of risk of, for infection is always higher. Other is the tra uh, tacrolimus. This is uh, more potent than the cyclosporine. Uh, its action is not just limited to the lymphocytes. It usually inhibits the release of the mast cells, mast cells as well. And um, unlike the asteroid, does not cause a skin uh, thinning, but the problem is uh, it's associated with some malignancy. It's the second line treatment for oral lichen planus. So in patients that they have a refractory uh, um, response to corticosteroid, or are unable to tolerate the side effect of the steroid at tracolimus is a, it's a, it's a good option, but it has to be used with um, in a short time. So what are the adverse events of this medication? Similar to cyclosporine, we'll have uh, uh, some effusions, uh, <clears throat> pericardial effusion, we'll have uh, here to teams, uh, but the malignancy, it's uh, the, block, uh, the black box warning because increase the risk of lymphoma and squamous cell carcinoma. The mTOR commonly used is the uh, cytolimus. This also called uh, ram, uh, rapamycin. It share a lot of the is structure with tracolimus. We usually use it for, um, again, refractory um, patients that are not responding to the, the, the typical uh, medications. And the adverse events are um, mainly include allergic reaction, risk of infection again. This in, in, include the nephrotoxicity and the less serious side effect are increased cholesterol or triglyceride levels, acne, and also it could also uh, cause an impairment of the wound healing. And the other common, this is one of the, the the second line after when you are not a patient not responding to pemphigus vulgaris is the mycophenolate uh, mofetil. It's a product of the mycophenolic uh, phenolic acid. Um, it it has to be done uh, in a slow doses. 
and you need to see if the patient is responding or not to the medication, you can jump to another of the medication. This is all uh, like a game that you do with the patient to see how they respond. Usually the, these are not long-term use medication and uh, you have time to evaluate in the patient in between the, the, the wax and, and, and wane um, episode. What are the adverse events of this medication? Usually GI issues, hepatitis, hypertension, uh, patient can have dizziness, depression, anxiety, bone marrow suppression, and again, also will have a risk of infection. Also has been associated with the uh, risk of a skin cancer, but um, it's not well demonstrated, but since that is appear everywhere right now. It, you have to be aware and, and, and let your patient know that the, these are the adverse events uh, before to prescribe the medication. The biologic, it's a preparation that is coming from the living organ, so or the product used as a therapeutic agent. Usually it could be uh, the biologic type, it could be vaccine uh, uh, coming from blood component, cells, allergen, and the most common classes that we have is the monoclonal antibody, the cytokine, the uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. That's uh, something that we use in, in several of these patients. The severe side effects are mainly lymphoma. So they are all associated, some of them, with um, malignancy. So that's why it's not easy to just prescribe this medication. You need to be very thorough and, and, and work with a multidisciplinary team to uh, start this treatment. You cannot just start this treatment because patient is not responding or patient or, or like a first line treatment. You have to go for the more conservative therapy and then go for this more serious and more um, uh, therapy that can have a serious adverse event. The infection is always a, a problem with this medication and uh, also can have some infusion reactions. So again, we need to be thorough when we prescribe this medication and always work with a multidisciplinary team. Finally, we have the DMARTs and the DMARTs are the disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, uh, acts targeting the cytokine, non-specific immune suppression or T cells or B cell activation and are potent drug that suppress the immune response by blocking the synthesis and <clears throat> interfering in this critical uh, uh, activity in the inflammatory cascade. So when you see the list of them of the DMR, you will have the methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, azathioprine, minocycline. So usually when you go for uh, oral pathology book, you will find that all this list is coming in the therapeutic uh, option for all these autoimmune or immune mediated diseases. So Again, we start DMAR when they are not responding to the traditional uh, medic uh, medication or treatment, and it has to be with uh, all monitoring of uh, and monitor uh, um, uh, blood tests, and we'll see what are the recommendations to start DMAR and to maintain a patient in DMAR. And that applies for all this uh, biologic or all this more uh, <clears throat> um, serious um therapeutics approach. We have the DNF uh, blockers, we have the uh, IL-6 um, receptor antagonist. So uh, anakinin rise is also a very common, the rituximab you will see a lot, uh, even for rheumatoid arthritis, it is a very common uh, medication. So before starting a DMAR, there are some consideration. You have to test your patient for tuberculosis and hepatitis B and C. Patient cannot be pregnant. And while man keeping the medication, the DMAR, it has to have the patient a regular blood test to check the, uh, including the, the lipid levels, uh, imaging test to check on the effect of this medication on the joint, and always um, be monitoring the adverse events like patient uh, lost weight because cause loss of appetite, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, so you need to think that we are providing a patient an immunosuppressive medication. If the patient is immunosuppressed already or patient is in with cancer treatment, this can be, a, it has to be monitored very well because we don't wanna have the patient with low response to other treatments. 
re the, the reactivation of tuberculosis is a, is a very uh, important um, consideration. And also the reactivation of herpes zoster, uh, reactivation of hepatitis B and C, that's why we need to do this test before. And can have increase of uh, cholesterol levels, so that's why we need to always check the liver function as well and uh, the risk of blood clotting. So let's have a break now. And if you have any question, I don't know if Dr. Dabudi is around. Any question? Yeah, so we have only one question. Um, so what is the pathophysiology behind the calcium channel blocker induced hyperplastic discriminative gingivitis and erosions. So it's probably that's more of the medication causing the hyperplastic. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not the calcium channel blocker that's causing in this, in this we are talking about calcium unit inhibitor. Right. So it's another uh, mechanism. And um, the calcium channel blocker, it's, it causes uh, uh, gingival hyperplasia. The calcium uh, inhibitor also causes uh, uh, hyper, um, gingival hyperplasia. The erosion is again we are we are causing this immunosuppressive in all the cells. So it's very common that all this medication can cause this uh, erosion. And even when we are we are using to treat this uh, erosion. You will see in the side effect or in the adverse event uh, that they, they can even um, induce Pemphigus vulgaris or induce these uh, immune uh, autoimmune conditions. So, yeah, it's kind of a challenge because you are trying to treat something and then you develop something similar, and and it's it's a it's a balance. That's why I always encourage to try uh, try and work with a multidisciplinary team to to regulate all these uh, medications. Um, yeah, so yeah, all the medication, it depends on their uh, group and what the type, um, not all the calcium channels also, they are causing this hyperplastic, but there are specific ones and there are depends on uh, the mechanism of the action, how they are doing uh, to the body, it can cause all this. Um, the other question we have is, uh, Colchicine being used. Yeah, colchicine being used. Yeah, it's it's it has been used. It's not that wide a uh, use. Uh, but right now we um when again when you go to the pathology or a pathology book, they have all this list of medication. Uh colchicine is more used for uh, uh, oral lesions that has associated some GI issue, like a vachet disease or kind of the, uh, um with other mechanisms that we are we are uh, we are treating, but not for the autoimmune conditions. It's not that uh, that well used right now. And because we have this biologic or this other option, uh, it's um it's it's a, it's an it's like it's an option, but not for this kind of autoimmune condition. Maybe for Bechet or 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 Crohn disease. Uh, so one more question. The, there is no question. So, but maybe we can explain if they want to do the biopsy. Uh, do you recommend to because you are, you said DIF and also uh, the where they should send or uh, how many biopsy the places that they have to do biopsy, what they should, what they are looking for, uh, the area they have to do biopsy. Because these lesions, most of them, they are very fragile, so that they have to be careful. And any uh, recommendation to do a better biopsy for the pathologies? Oh yeah, so um, definitely yeah. So when when you have this lesion, it's very hard to find a good place where to do biopsy because you will see all ulceration. Uh, when you send a, the to the pathology. Uh, <clears throat> an ulcer for biopsy, that's what you are gonna have as return. Like your biopsy report, we say ulcerative lesion. So what do we wanna do? We wanna have like a, at least in the, 
the DIF, that is the definitive uh, uh, biopsy report that we are waiting for, uh, the DIF should have at least a, a, the perilational, uh, like a healthy uh, um, area. So it has to be like perilational, meaning like you will see the ulcer. So try to take the biopsy like like two millimeters like next to the uh, the ulceration or the bulla in case that you have the bulla uh, intact. It's very hard though. So um, try to take a little of the good or the healthy tissue with the sick or the ulcer or eros uh, erosively um, tissue. So and that that's for the IF. For the HNI, that it will be uh, your first biopsy. Try to get something that you will see erosion, but no ulceration. Always when you have an, a biopsy with ulceration, you will get back for like ulceration. But for DIF, you will have to try to get like a good sample with healthy, uh, like around the area, healthy and not that, uh, and like the um, ulcerative uh, lesion. So that's why we call it perilesional. Yeah. If you are not sure, it's better to refer. <laughs> that's, that's the advice. Yeah. It's the same for us. If we we start managing the patient and if the patient is not having is not responding as we expect, or if the patient is having other uh, systemic uh, like a presentation, like fatigue, like we will not just keep in the patient with topical steroid or mouth rings or or gel. We have to refer the patient for consultation for either if we are dealing with uh, a suspecting a autoimmune condition uh, for um dermatologists or uh, rheumatologists, depending on what are the autoimmune condition we are suspecting. We never have to work all alone and think that we know everything because that's, that's not the truth. We are talking about people here <laughs> that we are treating. So uh, it's better to ask if you don't know. Okay. okay. Wonderful, thank you. So if we don't have any question, if you have any question, you can again send to Q&A so we can answer them. Okay. So uh, the immune-mediated disease with oral manifestation, this the difference with this is like, we don't know what, very well which is the uh, uh, um, autoantibody that is affected. That's why we say it immunomediated. Uh, these immunomediated diseases, we, uh, we're gonna review several, uh, some of them. Again, the one that we see more in the clinic and um, often present with uh, oral mucosite uh, manifestation as the, um, after system, uh, recurrent after stomatitis, lichen planus, or benign migratory glossitis. So I've, yeah, I forgot to say that when when you see this green uh, highlight is because that's the thing, uh, that's one of the answer for your the question, like the quiz up then. So immune mediated diseases result from this abnormal immune system response. Uh, usually, this abnormal function of the complement system and its re regulatory protein is from an anti-inflammatory cytokine imbalance and shift toward this T helper 1 and 7. Unlike the autoimmune disease, the antibody causing this group of disease, we don't know, or it hasn't been identified yet. And the causes of this condition are affected similar than the autoimmune conditions. For, uh, attributed by the environmental uh, affecting, including viruses, bacteria, radioactivity, uh, pollution, the diet, and also the living um, factors and the um, host factors. So if the patient is immunocompromised, it will be more prone to develop these uh, immune-mediated me uh, diseases. For example, like benign migratory glossitis, uh, it, you will find it in the literature as a geographic tongue, glossitis migrans, erythema migrans, or stomatitis areata. It's an inflammatory disorder. Generally, it's asymptomatic. So usually you will find it to the uh, in the patients um, like a clinical finding. So don't be scared. That's why you need to know how this look. Uh, the, unknown, uh, the, the etiology is unknown. And the location is usually the dorsum of the tongue, but sometimes can involve other side of the of the mucosa. Even in the buccal mucosa, you can find um, benign migratory glossitis and other um, in the lateral borders of the tongue. The demographic is usually in the third de decade of life, but you can even find children with uh, this condition or this uh, 
uh, presentation. So you see here in this patient, so the previous picture was super red. This one was uh, wasn't that red, and so you will you need to know and differentiate that there is this white rim um, <clears throat> surrounding this erythematous area. Uh, it's more frequent in female. Usually, it's a chronic relapsing recurring condition. It also has a family component. Uh, it could be um, like it, you all have to ask the, the patient if the, the father, the mother, the sister, or the brother has this uh, something similar in the tongue before to send patient for biopsy or before to send patient scared to the pathology. The past medical history of psoriasis and also is uh, it's associated with it and the stress, the anxiety. So everything that affects your immune response can uh, um, trigger this condition and patient can have it everywhere and even can be sometimes symptomatic. But it usually is asymptomatic, but when it's symptomatic, the sensation is burning sensation and that this can form. Patient can, or some patient can have affected the taste, uh, you will see this erythematous area, uh, which occurs due to the filiform papilla <clears throat> atrophy and the, um, the epithelium that is very thin. The white is in a slightly elevated margin surrounding this atrophy. The fungiform papilla are not uh, affected. And um, around 30% of the cases associated with feature tongue. So you will see, like in the in the lower side of the of the screen, you will see this feature tongue, and also like uh, in the next side and in, in the next uh, area, like next to this lesion, you will see this uh, erythematous area with surrounding this whitish rim. So it, you will see both sides, and then you will realize, oh, this is geographic tongue. So it's totally normal if patient is asymptomatic, not no treatment is needed. It has a strong associated with eczema, asthma, and psoriasis. The um in the in the histopathologic you will see something like that. Um, I'm not a pathologist, but you we will know how to differentiate that this is kind of, and it looks like pretty similar than the picture. But you see it this this spongiotic kind of pustule. Um. So, and have this variable lymphocytic infiltrate, and it can have some vas vascular ectasia that is like the fragility of the of the blood vessels. So that's why we'll see the change of color and sometimes it bleeds. The differential diagnosis, some uh, people like in this uh, picture, you, it look like candidiasis. So that's when the uh, wipe off or not wipe off, <clears throat> um, Assessment is is helpful sometimes to see if this is a candida. You will just uh, with a gauze, you will pass it around the tongue and make sure that it is it it is um, wiped off or not. And the candidiasis uh, is one of the differential diagnoses, like on planus uh, as well. You will see some depending of how severe or what is the presentation. It can look like this white striation. So like in planus is always a, um, a differential diagnosis to have in mind. When you will see only the white lesion on the white um, rim area, you can suspect like um, a, a leukoplakia. So also you need to know and ask the patient, this is comes and goes. And because this varies, it, it goes everywhere. It changed the location in the, in the, like in the mucosa, the leukoplakia will not change location. So that's the way that you can roll up. It can be like similar to, to lupus, uh, drug reaction, any inflammatory condition or autoimmune condition and the oral psoriasis as well. The management, uh, if it's symptomatic, we treat it. We treat it, again, just to manage the, the, the sensation of the burning. And usually we use mouth watches that contain lidocaine or any uh, anesthetic, uh, antihistamines uh, as well, or sometimes when it's very severe, uh, a course of topical es uh, esteroid or corticosteroid, it's helpful. And usually this will be dexamethasone rings. And also we try to address the psychological involvement, like ask the patient what, what, if they are stressed and anxiety in the, in the middle of exams or like a very difficult time in, in their life, they can trigger like a very painful uh, um, migratory glossitis. Then we have lichen planus. So lichen planus is uh, it's common. Like in our clinic, 20% of our patient in the oral medicine clinic, percent with lichen planus. 
It's a chronic inflammatory cell mediated immune disease and usually involves a mucous membrane, like the oral mucosa can affect the esophagus, the genital area, and also the skin. The lesion, usually the oral lesion presents as well first than the skin lesion, and the skin lesion treat uh, it is easy to treat. They respond much uh, faster to the treatment than the oral mucosa. And in the oral mucosa is usually uh, bilateral and can be long periods of remission. So we always need to uh, like educate the patient when to use the medications, when not to use it to avoid the uh, overexposure of the patient to the corticosteroid. And then um, to recognize what are the lesions, that's always a, a question from the patient. Like, what is when you say you will use this medication for when you have lesions? So patient will ask when is a, what is the lesion. So that's why it's super important to educate the patient when they use the medication or not. Usually we keep this patient because they are chronic condition. We we keep this patient with always a refill available. So they can manage when to rinse and, and manage. They don't need to come to your office every time that they have a flare up. So we have different type of presentations. <clears throat> so the reticular one is like this white kind of estri. Uh, it's usually I, when it's in that presentation is asymptomatic. And we have the other presentation that the erosive or ulcerative that is most symptomatic. The plaque-like, uh, that's the one that we, we see here in the tongue, in the dorsal tongue. And the erosive and ulcerative is the one that we we have to take care of. It's very, it could be very painful. It could be this burning sensation. And sometimes it's so severe that uh, some of the medication we review, uh, we need to treat it. We need to find. So the reticular uh, is white striation of papule that are not usually painful and the buccal mucosa, ventral, dorsal tongue, lip mucosa, and gingiva. The erythematous is more painful and <clears throat> usually start as uh, the, uh, the squamative gingivitis. So that's what we see here. So um, this reaction also can cause by a, a, a drug, like, like so like in a reaction is an is a, a, another presentation similar than the squamative gingivitis. So we say the squamative gingivitis is like a, a sign of something, a, an inflammatory condition, autoimmune condition is going on. Ulcerative uh, or erosive like implants is more painful and usually will have this yellow witch around because we have like this ulcer. And so we'll see this yellow fibrin membranes and it will look a little ugly, uglier. And this is the one that we, uh, <clears throat> sometimes have to rule out that it's not pemphigus. Um, so it's, it, it can look uh, similar to PB. And we have this other when uh, uh, clinical manifestation of lichen planus that is mainly after uh, the inflammation resolve. Uh, so we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So you will see these lesions uh, that were it used to be like inflammatory uh, lesion and then um, it resolved, but patient will have this uh, like post-inflammatory pigmentation. It, it's not like the ethnic um, hyperpigmentation, it's after uh, this inflammatory condition. And then you have also this atrophy or filiform papilla that is more the plaque-like. There is some different type of no and, under, and follow our patient with lichen planus. So there is like a, the scores. So you see it's more uh, a reticular, a atrophic, or sedative. So these scores are mainly to, for us to follow and to, <clears throat> to evaluate how patient, how patient is responding to treatment. So we, we make a score every visit to see if the, the, the patient is responding or not to the medication. Lichen plants also can be uh, have some involvement in the skin, like 10 to 15% of the patient will have some skin manifestation. Genital uh, lesions are also frequent. The presentation of the genital lesion, a uh, patient of course will rarely will see the lesion, but it will sent, uh, feel the sensation of burning. And they usually go to the uh, <clears throat> gynecologist to see if they have any other like infection, usually they are mistaken by, uh, for candida uh, or fungal infection. So, uh, and they don't respond to that treatment. So usually they respond really quick to clovetazole in the genital area. 
And the cutaneous uh, disease, um, it can be treated with a uh, corticosteroid as well. So these are some of the manifestations in the patient that we see. Histopathological, as, as we see, we will have this um, exclamation of the basal cell layer. We will see this band infiltrate, uh, uh, a lymphocytic band uh, area of infiltration uh, of lymphocytic cells. And uh, the lesion may be uh, parakeratotic or hyperkeratotic. And the, uh, you will see the acantotic or atrophic. So it's it's very, um, it has these three um, very characteristic presentation in the histology. So for the for a good oral pathology, will not mistake for uh, oral like implants. And in the DIF, because we are we usually when we suspect this lesion, we go for DIF as well. So you we, you will see this linear or chaggy fibrinogen, uh, fib and this also the pattern is more uh, located here in the membrane and <clears throat> the basement membrane zone. And the IgM positive for this colloid and membrane in, in the basement membrane um, is also like a, a positive for lichen plants. So the IF will confirm that it's lichen plants instead of the pemphigos or the pemphigoid. The differential diagnosis, chronic graft versus host disease, um, lichen mucositis, lupus erythematose, MMP, pemphigos vulgaris, but also, it's very, very important to understand another uh, rule out that very important that we need to do that is the epithelial dysplasia. So they can look similar clinically, but we need to understand the difference. So the difference, uh, it's in the lichen planus, it's usually symptomatic. Uh, the uh, uh, oral lichen uh, leukoplegia will not have this, uh, these symptoms. But uh, usually the is unilateral. Um, the the option for uh, bilateral it will be more the peripheral verrucous leukoplakia. That is not the case of uh, lichen planus, and we need the biopsy to actually rule out. So the treatment it could vary. We go for systemic to not systemic. There's no systemic. We just follow, but we need to identify that it's actually lichen planus. Sometimes we do biopsy as well, even when it's not uh, symptomatic, we have to do biopsy to have the ba baseline. And again, we have some cases similar and they look like similar to oral leukoplakia or uh, oral epithelial dysplasia. So in, in order to avoid missed, um, miss a, a malign possible malignant transformation, we need to make sure that we do biopsy. The symptomatic, the first line will be topical esteroid. We always start in the oral cavity with topical esteroid. In the oral cavity, we use closing an eye gel, ointment, or clobetazole gel, or ointment, and dexamethasone rinse. And then if patient is not responding, we jump, jump to the second line of treatment that will be the, topic, the systemic esteroid. And then if we don't respond to that, then we go to the systemic immunosuppressive agent, the myco, like of mycophenolate, uh, Mofetil, or then if we, um, if we is not responding to that, we can go to the uh, calcium, cal calcineurium inhibitor agents. Oral candidiasis has been noted in 11 to 45 percent of these patients with oral like implants treated with topical esteroid. So uh, when you have a patient with chronic condition and chronic use of this medication. You should, you should add, um, explain the patient what are the symptoms or the possible um, presentation of this uh, overgrowth of candida and uh, prophylaxis dose of, can, uh, of antifungal medication could be an option if patient is immunosuppressive. And then if we suspect that is a, a candidiasis around, then we should prescribe in combination the uh, steroid and uh, nystatin solution, for example, a topical medication as well. Another uh, uh, immune mediated disease is, is an, an inflammatory in presenting with this ulceration. And like you see in the picture, erythema, to, erythema multiforme, it presents very similar to the pemphigus vulgaris. But the erythema multiforme, the presentation is different. It's not like a chronic condition. It's a very acute uh, condition. Patient will have severe pain. We cannot, um, patient cannot eat correctly. So we'll have lo uh, losing weight, uh, 
uh, fatigue, uh, dehydration, because it's very, very painful. The demographic is younger patients. So this happens usually in patients uh, 20 to 40 years old. Um, and it's self-limited, but it's very painful. So even when it's self-limited, patient needs to be treated. So uh, we need to start patient usually in estuary. The oral lesions are present in, could be ranged from 25 to 70% of the patient. The clinical feature is very painful. Uh, you will have a, a erosion and lesions, ulcer, uh, like this uh, very ulcerative lesions in all over the mouth, including the lip, not just the oral cavity. Um, we have a different type, like minor type, type is less than 10% of the skin is affected. And then we have the major type that is more extensive skin involvement with, with mucous membrane affected. And then the chronic or recurrent oral erythema multiforme disaffect the oral mucosa only and not just the skin. So we have this, this uh, we did this report with uh, Dr. Davudi here. It, this was a patient with HSV, history of HSV, cause erythema multiforme, and then he has a, a, a recurrence after having COVID. So this could be the presentation, very severe, very painful. A patient will call you to your cell, uh, your cell phone to get medication right away. So this patient needs to be treated right away with um, uh, systemic asteroid. So it has to be a, like a very potent first dose, um, like at least like a week of, of asteroid for patient to, to calm down and, and manage the pain. The differential diagnosis are like always, like in planos, uh, contact like you know, hypersensitivity. It could be a Steven Johnson syndrome and also like pemphigus vulgaris, right? And the management in mild cases is managed with um, topical analgesic. Sometimes you just need a light, a lidocaine or dexamethasone rings, um, antiviral medication. But in more severe cases, we have to go to systemic. And um, for cases, for patients that they know that they have this reaction every time that they have a HSB flare up, uh, a prophylaxis dose of uh, cyclovir or valacyclovir for prevent recurrent disease and, and help to uh, also establish the diagnosis because it's so severe that we need to uh, understand and know how to treat this patient and, and rec that patient need to recognize. So always comes all this condition with education. So these patients are always very knowledge um, in all their symptoms because it's helped a lot to treat them um, so successfully. The erythema, erythema multiforme will have more hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, it's very associated with HSV. Usually we will see this target lesion and that you, you will find in all the or, uh, oral pathology books. It's self-limited, but the Steven Johnson syndrome is on a hypersensitivity reaction. It has a, a, a strong uh, associated with HLA uh, um, haplotype. Uh, and the problem with this is has uh, associated with malignancy. So Steven Johnson syndrome, if we suspect that uh, we send patient, patient usually has a, a more uh, severe condition and it has to be treated with intensive support management, including immunosuppressive. So usually in Steven Johnson syndrome, topical medication will not be enough. As on the opposite with erythema multiforme and usually having once uh, in life, uh, erythema multiforme will have more recurrent episodes and even more if it's associated with HSP. So finally, we are almost done. Uh, the aftosystem uh, after ulcer is another condition that you will find in this patient with either autoimmune conditions or immune mediated diseases. So the after ulcer could be very, very painful as well. And we need to know how to recognize them. So we have the idiopathic after ulcers, and we have also the after like ulcers, like can be infections ulcers, could be secondary to an autoimmune blister disease, could be secondary to erythema multiforme, like similar that we saw, or could be ulcers from malignancy. So uh, we have reviewed some of them already. So we are gonna go now finishing with idiopathic uh, recurrent after stomatitis, the infection ulcers, and the ulcer from malignancy.
So the after systematitis is usually immune mediated in, in family history, no viral infection. Uh, it's very painful. You will see this shallow, round, or oval ulceration. It usually is covered by this uh, gray and white fibrin. Um, before the presentation, patient can feel this tingling sensation and burning. So that's why we need to differentiate from the infection one that is more associated with herpes because patient will feel this tingling. So they know that when the aftas is coming. Again, the education is super important because this is the way that patient will understand. And sometimes they, we keep the patient with a gel or a cream for a year before, of course, the medication expire. So they can manage the symptoms by themselves. These conditions are different with the pemphigus. It's more frequent and, and common in, in younger patients, second, third decades of life. And we have the minor, the major, depending on the, si of the, uh, the size, like the mi uh, ma minor, minor is less than one centimeter, it's the most common. The major is more than one centimeter and can last for weeks, months, and even a scar formation. The herpes deform, you will see this uh, very multiple small lesion and can affect the gratinized mucosa, like the, the picture that you see there. And we have the other one that is more complex and severe. It's a very debilitating chronic pain, uh, like the lower picture. Usually patients that have this condition, they also are immunocompromised. So they will have uh, ulcers every uh, all in all the mouth. And usually they don't have a, a period without ulcer. So they will have constant ulcers everywhere. And can affect the keratinized mucosa as well. So the cause for this is stress, smoking, smoking sensation, hormonal changes, hematological deficiency, iron folate, vitamin B12, anxiety, and other things. The treatment is usually topical and aesthetic. We start always with uh, some um, lidocaine rings or solution <clears throat> or uh, benzocaine. And then we, if it's super severe, then we prescribe some topical steroid because we don't want to keep patient in, in severe uh, steroid. We will use um, a weak steroid at, at the beginning. But if it's very severe, then we go for a, 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 a potent steroid. And then we have blood tests for a major and severe. Colchicine is another option as one of the questions that uh, we have. Pentoxifilin, Dapson, or systemic steroid. And always, the, um, if you suspect it's, it's more than a 10 days, patient doesn't recognize this uh, condition before, they didn't have it before, so it's not a recurrence, maybe you should do biopsy and you should rule out a PV or MMP or even a squamous cell carcinoma. And if it's some GI issue involvement, then you should suspect Crohn disease. We have also the afters. <clears throat> like ulcers, but in the, the kind that are associated with some infection. The viral infection is a, it's one, um, the HSP one, it's the primary gingival stomatitis, uh, the recurrent herpes labialis and, and the one that is recrudescent. The HSP two that is associated more with genital uh, lesions and a skin lesion, but also will present lesions uh, in the oral cavity. The treatment again is as a, a cyclovir, because it's inflammation, we have to treat with topical steroid or systemic. <clears throat> and, um, and usually we start with cyc a cyclovir or valacyclovir patient not responding. The varicella zoster, we treat a primary infection. It's the varicella, uh, the chicken pox or reactivation, herpes zoster, chingles. The complication for uh, the viral infection, uh, remember the ramsey hunt syndrome, uh, may present with Bell's palsy and blister on the external ear and also some discussia. We have the other infection disease, and this is like more out of the scope of the, of the, of the lecture, but I just wanna show you the different uh, blister and different uh, after like uh, ulcers. So this is the coxsackie that has the hand, foot, uh, mouth disease or the hair pangina in children. This is affected more in children. So you see that the autoimmune uh, condition is more like in older patient, the kind of after like ulcer with the infection disease is more like in younger patients. 
And in the case of fungal infection, it could look like ulcers as well. Um, so this is like a picture with candida and will have ulceration, like you see some redness, erosion. So you, you can have this condition, not just one at the time. You can have both of them at the same time. And this is like how it looked like a patient after treat with, um, a patient has like inflammatory condition, we treat with topical steroid, and then you have this overgrowth of candida after treatment. The bacterial infection, you need to recognize if it's, of course, the syphilis, uh, it's a it's a uh, after slight ulcer. Uh, so we have after like ulcer, we viral, inf uh, bacterial, and also fungal. And then you have to remember that you always need to rule out malignancy. So any lesion that you are not sure what is happening. Patient doesn't have a history of happening before. This is not a comes and goes lesion. It's a lesion that continue there. Uh, it could be painful, no painful. It's very deep. A patient, it's, it's in an area that the trauma actually is hard to have a trauma there. Uh, so always be suspicious. And it's better to refer the patient when, when you don't know, but you always need to rule out that it's not dealing with some malignancy. So what is the take home message? So these lesions are very similar clinically. So it's very challenging to know which one is it, it is, but you need to know like all the features, keep it in mind, uh, see if they respond to some treatment. If it don't respond, then you need to think in something more serious and something more systemic. You need to talk with your colleague. You need to work in a multidisciplinary team so you can manage this patient properly. As we reviewed today, some of them can be associated with a high risk of cancer, malignancy. We, so we are dealing more just with pain. We are dealing also with the life of our patient. So it's important to identify the differential diagnosis and the correlation of the clinical finding diagnostic test for the accurate uh, diagnosis and management. And finally, I want to invite you to uh, our program. We have several programs in the Ostro online department. Uh, we have with community or health, geriatric dentistry, or official pain and oral medicine master and certificate, or a pathology and radio radiology certificate. We have the pain medicine and pain science master and certificate. So we have several programs that we uh, we are uh, building. Uh, we have done this for for years, but we are trying to grow every day and learning from our students. Many of them are here today, so I'm glad to see them all of uh, them here, but anyone that has any question or it's interesting and, and, and know a little bit more of this, any of this topic, um, I'll, be, I'll be super glad to answer your question. So this is my email. And for any more information of the program, this is the email for the program. And yeah, I think that will be it. Thank you. So, so, so if we, uh, if you guys have any question, you can send to QA, Q and A. If not, uh, thank you very much, uh, for having us and being here. Um, and uh, ask me if you have anything to add. We're all good. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Thank you very much. Nice. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. And don't forget, if you want your CE, you can go to the links and uh, that's going to um, uh, direct you to the questions and then you can get your CE. Thank you. Have a wonderful night.